Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. This episode is part two of our two-part series. This episode discusses the details of a double murder and may not be suitable for all ages. Listener's discretion is advised. We left off last time with the funeral of Marion Miley. We pick up our conversation with the search for her killers. Did they figure out who committed the crime? Not, not immediately. Now they took a. Uh, back then, the newspapers would. Uh, they write a little bit differently now mm-hmm. than they did back then. But they they did a poll of readers, mm-hmm. and it showed up like a couple days later, even before they knew what happened. And they asked, uh, "What do you think happened?" And the majority of people were saying it was an inside job. Mm-hmm. It turned out they were, they were correct. Yeah. But it took it took a while. It took about ten days to. Uh, catch the the first guy. Mm-hmm. How uh, many total were there? Was it thir- two? Three. Three, three. okay. The, uh, the uh, groundskeeper, mm-hmm. Raymond Baxter, mm-hmm. I think his name was Raymond Willie Skeeter Baxter, mm-hmm. was the guy who set up everything. You know, he worked there. He gave all the information. Yeah, he worked at the, at the country club and um, apparently was trusted by the Miley's, mm-hmm. uh, which turned out to be a mistake. Mm-hmm. But he set everything up. He wasn't actually, from the accounts I've read, he wasn't actually there inside the, the apartment. uh, apartments when the shootings and so forth were, were taking mm-hmm. place. But he, he, he paid the price anyway. Mm-hmm. But anyway, the police were lucky in that at the time this crime was taking place, uh, a newspaper carrier had come to deliver the Sunday morning newspaper. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, this, the Lexington Country Club was his normal right. route. Mm-hmm. And he was used to seeing cars there, you know, after a night of the dance, because mm-hmm. sometimes people go to dance and leave cars. But when he delivered the paper that Sunday morning, he noticed the Miley cars, Mrs. Mm-hmm. Miley's car and Marion's car. And he noticed a, a 1941 Buick, I think it was a Buick sedan. And the thing that caught his attention was that, He'd never seen that car there before Mm -hmm. and that one of the doors was open and he just made a mental note. You know, Mm -hmm. he didn't hear anything, see anything, but he just made a mental note to himself that uh, Mm -hmm. was kind of odd. Yeah. And it turns out that uh, when the news hit the front pages of newspapers, you know, he called the police and said, hey, I saw this car out there. And... um, they caught Thomas Penny, who was a two-bit criminal, mm-hmm. trying for a big score there. They caught him down dry, uh, down in Texas, Fort Worth, Texas, about 10 days later, driving that car. Now, Thomas Penny was on the police radar even before they found him in Texas with the okay. car mm-hmm. uh, because apparently when they were investigating this, they were thinking, well, this fits his motive of mm-hmm. breaking in places. And apparently two guys had come into the police station a couple of days after the murder and told the police, you might want to look at Tom Thomas Penny as mm-hmm. one of your suspects here because these two guys said he approached them a couple of weeks before with uh, a job to go rob the Lexington Country Club. Okay. So the police were on the lookout, put an all-points bulletin out for him and mm-hmm. also the car. And as most crooks do, they do something stupid to get caught. He ran through a four-way stop sign uh, down in in Texas, Fort Worth, right in front of a policeman and got pulled over. And then they put two and two together and they sent him back up here. Now, at this point, they didn't know who else was involved, Mm -hmm. but he uh, fingered uh, Skeeter Baxter Mm -hmm. uh, as the one who helped plan it. And then he named a friend of his, Robert Anderson, Mm -hmm. he was a Louisville business owner, and he named him as the shooter of 
the Miley's and his. Or both, both women. Yes, because apparently the investigation showed that all the shots were fired by one gun. It okay. was, I think, a thirty two caliber. Mm-hmm. Penny was caught with a thirty eight caliber. I see. Uh, so he fingered Robert Anderson, and then uh, Baxter verified that, yeah, Robert Anderson was our other person. So it didn't take them long. The trial actually started uh, the day after Pearl Harbor. They were all three found guilty mm-hmm. of murder, first degree. You know, Lexington was was devastated by this crime because mm-hmm. Mary and Molly was like the pride and joy. Yeah, she was so well loved and yeah. And you have to remember, this was small town Lexington. It's not like it is now. We mm-hmm. were a, a small town back then, yeah. and Mary and Molly was our star. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, no other way. To put it, she mm-hmm. was the star of Lexington, yeah. and uh, the the people of Lexington were just angry mm-hmm. that something like this uh, happened, and they wanted these murderers caught and tried and convicted, and wanted to warm up old Sparky in at Eddieville for them. Yeah. Editorials were written denouncing mm-hmm. the violence and the, and the brutality of the crime. People would would write in, mm-hmm. you know, saying how loved and respected Marion Molly was, and. I mean, it just broke, it broke the city's heart. Mm-hmm. And they were happy to see those three brought to justice. Oh, or, yes. Okay. And without the newspaper carrier mm-hmm. testimony and those two guys, I think those two guys who Penny had approached a couple weeks before were key mm-hmm. in getting the same solved because at that point they had a name. Yeah. Let's go look for Thomas Penny. Mm-hmm. And Thomas Penny wasn't reluctant to... to Name Anderson yeah. as the shooter. Now, the controversy in all this was that it, it turned out that uh, Robert Anderson, Baxter owned up to everything. Mm-hmm. and um, But Robert Anderson said, I wasn't there. And mm-hmm. he, he had reported his car stolen 10 or 12 hours after the crime. He said, I didn't have anything to do with this. So the Buick was actually Anderson's car that yes. Thomas Penny took? Yeah. Okay. During the trial, both Anderson and, or both uh, Penny and Baxter both fingered Anderson as the third man mm-hmm. involved. And so he was tried and convicted also. It is interesting that it took the jury just a few hours to convict Penny mm-hmm. and Baxter because they confessed and owned up. But I think it took them like a whole day to finally convict Anderson. And it gets even more bizarre after they get sent up to the big house mm-hmm. awaiting their execution. And this is late uh, 41, early 42. Mm-hmm. They are eventually all three executed in February 1943. Mm-hmm. Uh, they got things done a little quicker back then yeah. than they do. It is a small town, yeah. Yeah. like you yeah. said. And apparently Penny found religion mm-hmm. when he was in prison. A, a couple of nuns um, had come to visit him in the jail, mm-hmm. uh, Catholic nuns, and he... Mm-hmm. And he made a statement that he misled people and that Anderson wasn't the guy with them in the apartment. It was somebody else who conveniently had been killed like four months after the Miley murders. Mm. So he wasn't around any anymore to be tried. or, yeah. or uh, So he recanted his statement? He recanted his statement, not in a court of law, just mm. I think he may have gone to to the warden or Mm -hmm. whoever and recanted his statement that Anderson was involved. And then when they asked Baxter about it, Baxter was just a funny character in all this. He would, he would ask, well, what did Tom Penny say? And then he would go with what Tom Penny said. And and then uh, they asked him about Robert Anderson. Was he your partner? Mm -hmm. And then he, he hemmed and hauled and then said, well, what did Tom Penny say? Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't tell him, what are you saying? And he finally gave the same name that Tom Penny Mm -hmm. uh, said. And this guy was already dead, so there's Mm -hmm. no way to prove it. So um, he would not, uh, Penny would not go in front of a judge and testify that Anderson wasn't involved in it. He -hmm. he told people he didn't didn't do it. I just made it up. I was mad at him for this, this, and this. And uh, so the warden was really torn. Uh, and there's actually a book written about it called Execution Eve, mm-hmm. which is available in the Kentucky Room down at the Central Library, that goes into all this uh, uh, 
intrigue and, yeah. and recant, uh, recanting of the mm-hmm. confession and so forth. And the warden was really torn uh, about uh, in the in the governor, like, do we execute this guy? Then Tom Penny came out maybe a few weeks, a few months before the execution and, and said, I am not going to say one more word about it. My conscience is clear. Yeah. I've met my Lord, and that's all I'm going to say about it. And never said another word about it. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't go in front of the judge to either deny or, or admit yeah. that Anderson was involved. And that's part of the bizarre mm-hmm. uh, story involved with this case. Yeah, but they were uh, all executed. They were all executed, I believe it was February 25th, 1943. Mm-hmm. When they were convicted, they had the order of how they were going to be executed. Mm-hmm. And the warden at the time um, decided Anderson, I think, was going to be the last one executed. Mm-hmm. Well, they decided, or he decided, that Anderson was going to be the first one executed in, in hopes of maybe Thomas Penny would, you know, before he died, would just make a final up. decision. Yes. Was he or wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. And apparently, if, if, if I remember correctly, after all three of them had been executed, uh, Tom Penny had left a note with the warden. Mm-hmm. Uh, like with instructions not to read until after the executions or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and in As a it, final request. Yeah. And in it, he said that Anderson was indeed mm-hmm. the one with him. What do you think Marion's future possibilities could have been? Oh, gosh. You know, uh, it happened right before... Pearl Harbor and World mm-hmm. War II. So it's it's really a guessing game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because of the war, the, the women's golfing tournaments were curtailed. Yeah. And, of course, there wasn't any kind of prof- professional tour for women until after the war. So uh, I don't know how long she would have golfed. My instincts tell me that she was headed for... Great things. Or, uh, other things. Mm-hmm possibly great things mm-hmm. or she could have you know taken the route her father did and, and i think she could have been quite successful as, as a golf pro at a country club you know mm-hmm. you make a good living uh, with that but she had so many connections out there mm-hmm. through her golfing with the entertainment field the business field uh, the political field mm-hmm. i mean she had connections all over the country i think she would have had some opportunities she would have been a trailblazer, uh, presented with a lot of opportunities maybe other women at the time didn't, didn't have. Yeah. And like I said, I could actually see her being a Fortune 500 CEO. Mm. Uh, that's the, Well, she definitely had the drive, no yeah, pun she, intended. But, um, yeah, she, oh, yeah, good one. <laughs> <laughs> she was very competitive. I think she at first I, I thought she got that from her dad, and then after seeing how her mother basically crawled, 250 mm-hmm. yards for help. Mm-hmm. I'm like, she probably got it from both of them. Yeah. She had a very competitive spirit. And actually, there's a famous quote that when she went over for one of the Curtis Cup tournaments, mm-hmm. a reporter had asked her, once you become the best women's golfer in the world, mm-hmm. uh, what do you plan on doing next? And she said something to the effect of, well, not, why not the men too? Mm-hmm. You know? She, she wanted to be the best, regardless of, regardless of women gender. Or, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, she had mentioned going back to school mm-hmm. and becoming a doctor. I, I could see that. Mm-hmm. Uh, she had an interest in, in music. Uh, you know, it's, re- it's really sad when I was researching this, and, and her last photograph ever taken was the day before her murder. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Lex and Trot and Tracks had a race meeting. Apparently she was out there uh, petting a horse. Mm-hmm. And it's, it was on the front page of the newspaper on the day, the, the extra, when it was announcing her murder. And, and she just looked so happy. Yeah. And, you know, in just a few short hours, she'd be dead. And, mm-hmm. uh, well, she, she left a, a pretty good legacy. There is a tournament. There is a tournament. You know, she, her. yeah, she, 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 her legacy was uh, not only as a great golfer and sports mm-hmm. woman. You know, she was very personable and talented mm-hmm. and competitive. And like I said, it's, it's, it just, I don't think she would have limited herself to golf. Yeah. And, uh, I think she would have really done some special things. Yeah. After her death, the Marion Miley tournament 
was begun in honor of her. Mm -hmm. And each year, women uh, golfers go out and compete for the the, t uh, the title of the Marion Miley Championship. And, um, you know, this has been going on since the 40s. Mm -hmm. So at least 70 years of women golfers, they definitely know who Marion Miley is. Mm -hmm. She was just the star of Lexington. I don't mm -hmm. know how else to put it. I, I think she was our Amelia Earhart, left us way before her time. Yeah. Um, and I think the circumstances of her death being so close to Pearl Harbor made a lot of people kind of divert attention to it. Uh, it did, yeah, Pearl Harbor. And, things, yeah, it did. Pearl Harbor yeah. and World War II mm -hmm. uh, diverted, I guess you could say, the sadness and mm -hmm. the tragedy. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I grew up here in Lexington. And I, I knew of her, didn't know much of her story other than she was a great golfer and she was murdered. Mm -hmm. There was a documentary film that KET put out. Uh, on the 75th anniversary mm -hmm. of, of, of her death in 2016, and they called it Forgotten Fame, mm -hmm. uh, the Marion Miley story, yeah. which is a one-hour documentary on her life, and mm -hmm. I think they did a good job with it. Of course, her story always gets dominated by the murder yeah. and the guys who com who committed it. Mm -hmm. But that Shouldn't uh, overshadow her life. Yeah, yeah her, her she, she had a great mm -hmm. short life, and I think she would have done some... Mm -hmm other great things. Yeah, and she lived it to the fullest. Well, thank you, Wayne. Yeah. Thank you for, for sharing her story and, and celebrating her life and her accomplishments. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm, or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at l-e-x-p-u-b-l-i-b dot org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.